you're on. Thank you very much, Henry, and thank you for bringing us together. It's really exciting to hear everyone's hear about everyone's research and be together um, today. So thank you again. Um, I direct the musculoskeletal control and dynamics lab within the biomedical engineering uh, department. And the goal of our lab is to improve and preserve mobility. And towards this goal, we have three branches of research and activity. First, we focus on understanding the neuromuscular control of human movement. Um, we are starting to develop personalized biofeedback to train movement strategies by conveying human movement sensor data in real time through sound. And um, we are also engaging in educational outreach to diversify the future of STEM. And we're really thrilled that recently we've, um, we have NSF support for all three branches of um, research and activity in our lab. Um, the first goal is to determine how older adults balance while walking and turning in real world contexts, and to try to improve their balance control using sonification, or again, like displaying data through auditory cues. And to complement this research activity, we will continue to grow our STEM outreach activities, specifically with young dance students. We have other activities within the lab, um, within these three themes, including sports and orthopedic biomechanics, including projects to study how baseball um, players pitch and bat, um, at not only at the whole body level, how they control their momentum, but also how each individual joint contributes to really amazing um, movements. We're really excited that um, we're planning the first virtual but seventh international conference on movement and computing, which is really exciting for Stevens because it brings together a community of innovators in human computer interactions, including pioneers in sonification. And when we're able to join again in person, we look forward to continue our annual participation in National Biomechanics Day events to make biomechanics accessible to young students in the community. So for today's very brief talk, I'll focus on these two topics within the career grant. And we are really interested in understanding how older adults turn while walking in real world contexts because falls continue to be one of the leading causes of the decline in quality of life for older adults. And depending on our environment, up to half of our walking steps could be part of preparing for or performing different types of turns. And from a mechanics perspective, turning is really fascinating because we have to manage translation, rotation, and balance goals concurrently. And these goals conflict because for balance, balance is facilitated with when our body center of mass is between our feet and when the ground reaction forces or our interaction with the ground is, um, is done in a way where the forces are acting towards one another or towards the body center of mass and canceling out the horizontal reaction forces. Whereas rotations really require that these ground reaction forces act and at a, you know, are directed away from the center of mass and act at a, a distance away from the center of mass. And you'll notice if we have forces aligned in this way to accomplish our rotation goals, we might not accomplish our translation goals at the same time. So when people need to rotate and translate or move horizontally through space at the same time, it really represents a substantial achievement of the full body. And that's why um, two-legged robots and people with sensory motor deficits struggle to turn. So here's an example of a person with Parkinson's disease struggling to turn in the clinic. So in a pilot study, we asked um, older adults who had fallen at least two times in the past six months to walk and turn at a normal pace and then walk and turn at faster than normal paces. And we measured how they controlled their angular momentum during these two tasks, as well as how their center of mass traced between their feet when they were, when they were turning. So I'm gonna present two examples here where subject A makes a leftward turn. We see the trace of the center of mass in um, black and green between the feet. And we see that generally this person was able to keep their center of mass between their feet. But 
that wasn't true for all of our participants. And for this participant, we see that the center of mass, and let me just use my mouse here, um, leans a little bit closer to the edge of, or the boundaries of the base of support or the area in contact with the ground. And this could present a problem, but really these preliminary findings generate far more questions than the answer because um, maintaining balance is not always about maintaining perfect ability to maintain um, your center of mass centered in your stance. It also requires modulating and shifting your weight fluidly. So when we see the, these types of behaviors, in addition to the um, changes we, or the person-specific control of angular momentum that these people exhibited, we're not sure if these are good or bad patterns. Certainly on the right, it could be dangerous if this person is not aware that they're leaning over their edge of their base of support, or if they lack the control or strength or coordination to um, push effectively if they had a perturbation when they were at such a, um, a state with low um, balance or low stability state. So this really brings us to the second part of the research having to do with if we um, can better understand if people and older adults in particular while they're turning and, and doing transitional maneuvers, if they can improve through practice with biofeedback. So I first learned about sonification through interaction, interacting with artists at USC and um, people, the artists I interacted with were primarily using sonification for entertainment purposes. And in this example that I'll show now, they used um, pressure sensors and inertial measurement units or wearable sensors embedded in sneakers to create an immersive sound environment that someone's interacting with. So we'll take a look here. sonification can be fun and now the research question is really how can these best practices in the entertainment industry be translated for clinical um, impact and so sonification opens a few doors because there, there are many different reasons but the primary reason I'm excited about sonification is that it allows people to navigate environments while um, focusing their visual attention where it needs to be as they move about space and the second most exciting reason is that sound is often perceived as a whole system. Sound and music are perceived as whole systems, um, even though there are many different parts contributing concurrently. So those are two highlights of sonification. And what our lab has started to do is develop sonification um, biofeedback where um, this, the relationship between the center of mass and base of support and the size of the base of support are, are conveyed through soundscapes and different sound parameters. And so we'll show um, that, actually, I have to say this part too. Um, we're focused first on how people shift their weight because this is impar imperative for daily mobility. And it also contributes to up to 40% of older adult falls. So here's an example of our early prototype with a dancer interacting and really exploring the ranges of the sound as they shift their weight and change their base of support size. So we're very excited to further develop this technology with input from end users and with input from multidisciplinary collaborators and music, sound design, psychology, geriatrics. So we're really excited that this is the starting point for our lab. So with that, I thank you for taking a brief tour through our lab virtually, and I welcome any questions. Thanks very much, Antonia. Very exciting work. And I don't see any questions. Uh, online. Uh, let me ask you a simple question. Uh, as you know, music has long been known to have a therapeutic effect, right? And uh, certainly now you've shown an outstanding example of how music could be uh, equipped 
or could be used also to control the balance uh, uh, people, emotion, especially the elderly. Um, as we know, the fall of elderly people is one of the most, uh, if you will, life-threatening uh, potential uh, is pretty uh, pitfalls that our uh, senior citizens may have. So when it comes to the selection of music, you have a few examples, right? And uh, you have classical music, you have rock and roll, so you have this Absolutely. and that. Any, any particular music that you think would be uh, most effective? Yeah, so one thing I didn't touch upon is the personalization of the sonic biofeedback and how that might be incorporated in um, next stages of the sonification design. But there's also a body of research that um, in the music therapy world that has been going on for years and years, as you mentioned, that um, if you have music that's very close to people's heart, you can either have an excellently positive emotional response or completely negative too. So, so we have to delicately balance the preferences for sound and music that people have with the safety of making sure not to trigger an emotional response when we really want the interaction to be more informative than emotional, I, I, I guess. So we have to play with that and we have to have collaborators um, in our research to make sure that we're balancing between um, sounds that aren't so beautiful that they're complex or emotional or mm -hmm. so rudimentary that they're offensively annoying. So we're, we're figuring this out, but there is certainly uh, best practices in sound design in the entertainment field that we're starting to pull from as well. That's great. And, uh, uh, yeah, if you're recruiting a human subject for your study, please uh, come me in. <laughs> Once it's safe to do so, we'll, we'll let everyone know. Okay, I have one question yeah. online. Let me see if I can open the window. Ah, somehow I couldn't open the window. Jeriza, can you open the Q and A window? Yes, I, I actually have the question too. Has the frequency response of the elderly ear been considered? And this is also a really important question to answer. Um, we not only have some idea of how frequencies in, in music and sound can have a really negative impact in people and we can increase people's anxieties depending on certain frequency ranges, but we also have to learn more about the elderly ear. So that's, that's definitely something I look to learn from my collaborators um, as we grow this research. So it has not, the short answer is it has not been considered yet, but it certainly needs to. So thank you for that, that question. <laughs> 